my microphone. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay. So let's see. Stop this. Hello, let me start sharing my screen again. So I'll be showing you how we build computer vision products at home to go My name is Antonio Rueda, and I'm a data scientist at home to go We'll be talking about image quality enhancement, which is called beautification. Also, image similarity evaluation, which is an important business problem by, for us in home to go and also image classification that we call tagging. So I'm specializing in computer vision. I have a background in computer science and biomedical applications, and I previously worked in academia. I now teach data science at the Data Science Retreat at Thinkful. I currently host the Berlin Computer Vision Group, which is a bi-weekly group that um, focuses on teaching computer vision subjects to anybody who's interested. You can look us up in Meetup, we're gonna have an event this Friday and we're gonna have another one uh, next Monday. So first I wanna introduce the topic of computer vision. Computer vision is making a computer understand some of the semantics that we humans intuitively get out of images. So what a human sees in an RGB regular image is actually a multi-dimensional matrix for a computer. We have intensity levels for every single image channel. And these are some, these are things that uh, we need to educate the computer somehow in order to uh, figure out interesting patterns for us. So we do things uh, related to semantic analysis and also aesthetic analysis in computer vision. Semantic analysis is related to the image content and aesthetic analysis and image quality is related to features such as the quality of the image, its color, contrast, and things that are features that have statistical descriptions. Why do we do computer vision at home to go? Well, we're a search engine of vacation rentals. We have 70 million offers and hundreds of millions of images. We actually have the largest vacation rental inventory in the world. So for us, computer vision is important because we know that users want to envision the experience of a rental before booking. So this is a very important uh, business problem. I'm gonna start talking about image quality enhancement, which we also call beautification and refers to improving the quality of images in our inventory. So why do we do this? We know that Airbnb invests a lot in high quality photography. So they hire professional photographers because they know that having high quality images to showcase properties brings an increase in earnings and bookings. The value of professional photography is something 
that is uh, high. The thing is that for us, we have the problem that we don't control image acquisition. We aggregate the results of different vacation rental providers. We aggregate the results of Airbnb, Booking.com, and Virgo. So, and about a hundred other more vacation rental providers. So we don't actually control the image acquisition part. Sometimes we get images that are captured with very low quality cameras, such as uh, cheap smartphones. And we don't have control about this part of the process. We don't control image acquisition. Images with this quality are usually taken with high quality professional cameras, such as this DSLR camera. And you can see that the quality of images that we obtain from conventional cameras, from cheap iPhone cameras or uh, regular smartphone cameras is noticeably different. So this is an example of how do the images from a DSLR camera differ from the images from an iPhone 3GS camera. We see that changes in the resolution are quite apparent. And we see how the blueiness of an image is apparent in both of uh, these cases, in both the iPhone 3GS camera and in the Canon 70D camera. We see that even with the high resolution camera, we can get effects of blurriness due to motion of the camera while the image is being taken. There's a lot of interest in industry in increasing the quality of images. And currently, uh, companies like Flickr have been doing research in how changing the quality of filters and the type of filters enhances uh, engagement, or it even reduces it. This is a paper that was published about three years ago, and it's quite interesting about the findings that uh, user engagement, about the findings on user engagement and the quality of the images. So we're currently using a generative adversarial network to enhance the quality of our images. Uh, we have been using this GAN that emulates the quality of a DSLR camera. And it was trained with co-registered pictures from phones, that from, from smartphone cameras. And we have been obtaining uh, quite nice results. So here you can see some beautified images that we have obtained with our GAN. The results are quite nice on images that have a lot of vegetation. I want to introduce you now to the topic of image similarity evaluation that we call matching at home to go. This is important for us because it allows us to understand our inventory. And one particular use case for this is the computation of strike prices. We have usually uh, offers that appear by that appear on, on different providers. So we might have uh, this particular booking being offered by Travelocity, by uh, Booking.com, and other providers. So in order to match uh, the offers, we need to evaluate. Uh, whether the metadata is the same. The problem is that different providers have different metadata. And these formats are usually quite noisy. So it's difficult for us to evaluate out of the descriptions of the offers whether two offers are actually the same. So we figured that the best way to do this was to evaluate the primary images. And we have designed a framework for doing this. So evaluating similarity is something that has some fine points because semantic similarity can be different to perceptual similarity. Having two images that both describe bedrooms, uh, it's different than having a fancy high uh, concept art bedroom versus 
uh, bedroom that one can find in a cabin or something like that. So we use both uh, semantic similarity uh, criteria like tagging and perceptual similarity. We use a variety of distance and similarity metrics in order to evaluate whether uh, things are similar or not. And we also use different models and sample in the duplication pipeline in order to distinguish whether two offers uh, are actually belonging to the same rental unit, as we call it. So perceptual hashing is a technique for evaluating aesthetic similarity and uh, visual similarity that is based on creating hashes that are similar when the images are similar. Here you see that uh, the edit distance between these uh, two hashes is zero because the perceptual hashes that we obtain from them are the same. These are different from cryptographic hashes in the sense that changing a little bit of the image creates a little change in the perceptual hashing. Whereas using a cryptographic hash will completely change the hash of this image versus uh, the other one. We evaluate our matching algorithms using metrics of precision and recall and the F1 measure. So different use cases requires us to optimize for precision or for recall. So we currently balance these trade-offs and we usually use the F1 measure, which is a metric that balances the precision on recall as seen using the harmonic mean of these two metrics. We cannot get a high F1 measure if precision is high, but recall is low and vice versa. Both of these metrics have to be close to one for the F1 measure to be one. We use the F1 measure when we value precision and recall equally. We might want to use the F05 measure when we value precision more or the F2 measure when we value recall more. For us, it's important to uh, be aware that many false positives are uh, could appear in our matches. A false positive is an image that is labeled as a duplicate, which is not really a duplicate. Here we see two bedrooms that are highly similar. We see that uh, the decor is practically the same and the bed arrangement is practically the same but this is uh, not the same room. So we take into consideration how the similarity of these two images uh, might actually make them a false positive in some cases. One technique that we have been currently using for evaluating similarity are convolutional neural networks. We have been using the embeddings of free trained convolutional networks to create descriptors for different images. So we take the activations of the final layers of a convolutional network and we evaluate the cosine similarity of the activations. The cosine similarity is a metric that uh, tells us whether two vectors are orthogonal to each other. If they're orthogonal, it means that the images are completely different. When the cosine similarity is close to one, it means that the images are quite similar. You see that in these two cases, we have highly similar images with a high cosine similarity and dissimilar images with a low cosine similarity. I want to introduce you now to the topic of image classification, which we call tagging at home to go and here we go back to the difference between what we perceive and what co what computers perceive so here in this image uh, we see an outdoor image of a building that has a snow but the computer only perceives a matrix of numbers so we need to be careful about whether these pictures that we're using for a classifier have enough samples to be shown to the algorithm. And this actually represents an investment for us because we need to identify images that actually 
have a snow in order to train the algorithms to detect it. So why do we do image classification? Well, we like to, we want to understand our inventory. We want to know how many of our offers have pools, balconies, and sea views, and which images have better conversion rates, which images are more liked by users. So we also do targeted advertisement for SEO and CRM. And this is something that uh, allows us to understand how to target customers better. We have been doing analysis of what the users care about when looking at the images. And in different surveys, we see that uh, features like the view and the outdoor image of the house is important for most users. And we use this, uh, um, this hierarchy of what's important for users in order to define taxonomies in how to label our images. So for example, we define a rule for tagging indoor images if the sky is visible, but if we're looking at it through a window, then this image is to be labeled as indoor. A model that we have been using for classifying images uh, successfully is the ResNet. Uh, this is a well-known architecture in deep learning. We usually architect the final fully connected layers in order to create classifiers that have higher precision and higher recall. So defining a taxonomy is one of the most challenging parts of creating a good image uh, classification pipeline because we need to define what is important for us. So in this particular image, you could say that this is a bedroom, but also shows a terrace. It has a desk and it also has vegetation. So do we have enough images that combine these things? We also have images that have you know, classes that sometimes we have not defined in the taxonomy. Like, should we have added neon lights to our taxonomy? And how many of these things uh, do we have? It's always a question whether we should invest on this. So something that we have been looking into is using uh, object detectors that have been trained on very, very large data sets, such as the Open Images dataset by Google that has about 10 million images. And we have been looking to create a taxonomy that is more fine-grained to small areas in the image. So this taxonomy would actually describe living rooms in a way that it's more fine-grained to the visual features that appear at different areas. This is an output of a faster RCNN model that we have been using to describe living rooms. Another aspect that is important for us is getting more of the humans in the loop because actually labeling and relabeling images with the aid of a model is something that actually lowers the cost of hiring uh, people to label the images. So we have working students who help, them, who help us on this. And this is something that in the field is currently called active learning, which is just using a model to guide the labeling. It's usually uh, wasteful to label everything in the machine if we only have a couple of classes in which we make uh, more mistakes. So services like SageMaker, Ground Truth, and the human labeling in the Google Vision API have been able to make this easier. So as a summary of the presentation, we're currently tackling uh, these three problems. And we work closely with user research, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And actually, these pipelines for creating classifiers and uh, object detectors and image quality enhancement are things that we're going to iterate continuously. Model decay is a real concern because our inventory updates often. Model decay refers to the fact that uh, Models need to be retrained with new sample data as the environment in which they are deployed changes, which is a reality for us. 
So this is what I have for you guys. I would like to invite you to the group that I host every two weeks, which is the Berlin Computer Vision Group. You can find us on Meetup. And we're going to have an event this Friday, particularly focus on object detection. So that's what I have. I, uh, yes, so Antonio, thank you for that. Um, and look, apologies everyone for the delayed start. I've been having some issues with my connection. I hope my quality is a little bit better now. Uh, but now we are going to have our second presentation. It's going to be Christoph, who is the head of AI at Signatrix. Signatrix are a company who are bringing AI and computer vision together to help uh, and provide retail solutions. Um, Christoph, thank you, and be sure to follow Antonio at his meetup, and be sure to check out Christoph's podcast that we've done only two weeks on the AI and Action podcast page. Yeah, th thank you, Anthony. I think you guys can hear me. Uh, I hope so. And so, yeah, as I said, I'm uh, Christoph, or I haven't said that yet. I'm Christoph. I'm uh, the head of AI and CEO of, of Signatrix. And um, yeah, first, to my background, I'm uh, a mathematician, or I have advanced degrees in mathematics and economics and in philosophy, but mostly I've done mathematics. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I've been working with the company, I've co-founded the company like three years ago. And um, so I've been working in machine learning and deep learning for five or six years, maybe. And so um, my talk will be first of all about Signatrix, um, what we're doing, what our approach is as a company, then a little bit about shoplifting because our products, I think you have to motivate a little bit what we're doing, why we're doing it the way we're doing. Um, then a few specifics about the products and about how we, um, we bring them to market. And then finally, um, a lot about deployments because we've learned that basically building like a prototype for a deep learning or machine learning system is rather easy nowadays. What is really hard is to productionize this, these systems and to uh, prepare them for real scaling, especially if you don't have stuff that runs in the cloud and instead you have systems that are are uh, running on edge devices because then basically all of your devices become something like IoT devices and uh, they're just the most complex IoT devices ever invented and so you need IoT level scaling for everything. All right, so first of all, Signatrix. We are uh, a startup from Berlin um, and we we are 15 employees right now. As I said, founded in 2017 together with, uh, I founded the company together with my two co-founders, Philip and Felix, and we are very engineering heavy. That means that we are from our, our 15 people, 10 are, I think 10 are engineers. Um, and I think that will remain that way. And we want to bring deep learning and computer vision to physical retail stores. That means we we want to help the people who are running these stores to really benefit from these very new and fantastic techniques that all of you I'm sure know about, and uh, we think it's uh, it's a big opportunity and. Our thesis is that the retailers, they are waking up to the potential of this. They are, in the beginning, they were quite skeptical because like 15 years ago, people were selling them cameras and these cameras could produce some kinds of heat maps for them. And then they could say, okay, there were like a little bit more people on this part and where the milk is, people walk. Yeah, okay, everybody knew that already. And so it was not actionable. And our idea is that with deep learning, you can do so much more. And stuff like, for example, Amazon Go, which is this automated checkout system that Amazon has built, um, basically proves this kind of thesis. And we want to go all the steps for the existing retailers together from using uh, stuff for niche applications, which is like the stuff that we're doing right now, to get uh, towards really understanding the, the store on a whole new level and automating processes and uh, really getting everything up to the level that you can do with AI and with, with deep learning. All right, and so our go-to market has been with shoplifting. Why is that? 
The first thing is shoplifting is a big problem for retailers. Uh, that means that they lose around 1% of their revenue um, to stock loss. That's for grocery stores, which are our main customers. And um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but on the other hand, they have one to 3% in gross margin. That means that if you can get away or get rid of, of shoplifting, then you would potentially double their, uh, their earnings more or less, and that would be pretty nice. And uh, so in all in all, it's like a $100 billion problem. So it's big, right? That's nice if you want to build a startup. And um, the case is that thieves are using a set of tricks and methods to steal. That means they are there. Some of them are just taking stuff on the um, on the shop floor and putting it into their their uh, jacket pocket or something like that. But the real problem is people using basically the processes in a store in a way where you can steal without having any kind of risk. And we want to make these methods harder or get uh, basically get the, the thieves to. Um, to or prevent them from doing it altogether. And um, this is much of, of this is about organized crime because there are really professional shoplifters and they steal like half the stuff that's being stolen from stores. And they always use tricks because it's just more, much more efficient. So they come in with big bags and they, they use certain tricks and we will talk about a few of them a little later. And yeah, as I said, we are focusing on these tricks. So our idea is not that we can do this stuff on the shop floor, because if we can do that, this is more or less analogous to the Amazon Go thing, right? If you can understand that somebody has taken something that they shouldn't do, then they, you can also understand what somebody has taken that they, they are just buying. This is more or less exactly the same process. So in the end, we will be there. But right now, we are focusing on something a little bit smaller. And so... Yeah, we have two systems. One of them is called Cardwatch Entrance, which is for open entrances, and one of them is called Cardwatch Checkout, which is for the checkout of stores, but the standard checkout, like like you have a cashier and you have a conveyor belt and all this stuff. And so Cardwatch Checkout works in a way where basically you have a small camera here. So this is the conveyor belt, this is the cashier up here, um, and you see uh, or there, there is basically this small camera that we introduce, and this camera analyzes what's in the shopping cart. And if there's something in there of value, we will display it on the, the screen of the uh, the cashier. That is a rather small application. It basically replaces the mirror that you have. So if somebody has forgotten something, or you know, accidentally, or maybe on purpose, forgotten something during the checkout process, then usually it's the the case that the cashier has to stand up and look into the shopping cart, or they have to look into some mirror to make sure that there's really nothing left in the shopping cart, and um, that that is a problem because it slows everything down and people steal that way. And some people just discover that stealing is very easy that way because you forget something really accidentally and you get away with it. And the next time you try it again, and you know this time you might try something a little bit more expensive, and in the end you are like a habitual shoplifter. So this is why you have to really present some kind of of risk there to the shoplifters. And we are doing it, as I said, with a small camera. There's a compute device there that talks to the checkout PC, and um, then yeah, the cashier sees this kind of overlay. The second system is called Cardwatch Entrance. This system is about the open entrance of a store. So in a modern store, in most of them, you don't have gates at the entrance. And instead, basically, you walk in and you walk in onto the shop floor. The problem there is these gates were meant to stop people from walking out through the entrance. And people are doing that, and especially professional thieves are doing that. And that means they pack shopping carts full of goods and just walk out through the entrance, through the vegetable section, usually. And so that takes like two seconds. Then they look like somebody who came from uh, the checkouts and had paid. And if nobody's looking in these two seconds, well, the shop is in trouble and uh, yeah, nothing, nothing prevents the, the person from walking out. This actually happens a lot and uh, it's a really big problem because these thieves, being professional sh uh, shoplifters, they are stealing like high value goods, like, I don't know, alcohol, coffee, these kinds of things, which is really, really painful for the stores. And so these are the two pro products that we have. Here, it's again, it's the case that we have a camera that's in the vicinity of the entrance. So it has to see the entrance the right way. And then there's a tiny computer. We have a detection model running there that just sees, okay, there's somebody walking with a shopping cart. And then we analyze the contents of the shopping cart with a secondary classifier. If the shopping cart is actually full, then we will, uh, and, and has interesting contents, basically not just a receipt or something like that, then we will um, notify somebody, that, for example, 
by Telegram or some other means that we have uh, developed. And I will show you a few videos uh, about this. The first one, or this is just a photo. Uh, here's the video. So here is the inside of the store, and this is basically the gate. So the customer walks in from down here. I, I hope you see my, my mouse pointer. Uh, the customer walks in from here, from the bottom uh, right of the image, and then walks through these gates, and then they are on the shop floor. And here's one shoplifter. This is an actual um, a video from, from a, a professional shoplifter that we, we have caught with our system. This is an early version of the system. That's why it's a little bit you know, flickery <laughs> in terms of, of the uh, bounding box that you see. And there you can see that the person has, they've put stuff like uh, toilet paper on top. Right now they wouldn't put toilet paper there because that's like the most, most valuable thing in the store. But back then that was like, you know, you cover the stuff and below that there's alcohol and other stuff. And so this is how it looks like. This is um, another video that's pretty disgusting actually. And so this is like a, Salad bar that you see in a store. Down here, this is the the exit. So this person out walking out here is coming from the checkouts, which are up here. And so this this guy has a spoon, and now he just goes to the salad bar and takes a little bite before walking out. And this is actually also stolen goods. And so it turns out older people are actually doing that, which is was surprising to me. This is from the US, from another of our deployments. Here, this is like um, uh, an alarm system for us. And so it's connected to our system. And if somebody tries to walk out, there is like a, a voice telling the people not to do it and the, uh, the lights flicker. And so this is again an, an actual uh, sequ uh, sequence. So this is th this woman and her children and they walk out. And then you see if the first the voice started and the, then you see that and the, the people are just very irritating. They don't steal in the end. This is our favorite picture of ever. These are two actual thieves that our system has caught and they just look like thieves from, a, I don't know, um, Francis Ford Coppola Godfather movie kind of thing. And you can see they, they're they stealing uh, here. These are packs of Jack Daniels whiskey. And so, yeah, it's a lot of value that left the store that way. All right, these are some of our customers. Um, this is our biggest customers, Europe's largest retailer, but they don't like their logo being on things. And so we can't tell you about them, but there are two candidates. It's one of the big German discounters. One of them starts with A, the other starts with L, and one of them is our customer. And uh, we are already in like 1,000 checkouts with them, and we are approaching a much bigger rollout that uh, I will talk about a little later. All right. Now, a little bit more about our applications. This is all basically pretext before I talk a bit more about um, deep learning. Uh, the first thing is everything is on in edge deployment. That has two main reasons. One is that uh, it's uh, just in terms of the data that you have, you can't just pipe them out of the store. A lot of the stores that you, you find have like a one megabit connection to the outside world. So there's no way to, to pump out this data even uh, you could bring in LTE, but that would be very, very extensive. Um, the, the other thing is, of course, data privacy. So if you do everything at the edge, uh, you, it's much easier to argue that you're, um, you're not saving stuff and that you're, you're being GDPR compliant. Um, we, because we are doing edge deployments, we have developed very, very efficient systems. So a lot of our optimization is not really building systems that are much better in terms of the, um, the, the for example, object detection quality for, for benchmark data sets. It's about really building the stuff that is most efficient on hardware so we can use tiny hardware because then you can earn more money in the end or build cheaper products or, or products with better margins. And um, another thing that is very, very important for us is that everything is very easy to deploy and service because the people in the stores um, are usually not that well educated. And so you can't expect anybody to interact with the complex system. All the systems have to be like as simple as possible. I will talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, yeah, our solutions, they bring you real time notifications. That means they they will give you alerts via Telegram, via like we've seen sounds or visuals on displays, or uh, we can alert the uh, like the CCTV system that's already there. We can alert the detectives in a, in a manner of ways, and so you get all kinds of notifications, and usually within like two seconds of somebody really stealing. Um, they are fully GDPR compliant. We're not saving anything unless somebody's really stealing. So then we save stuff that is uh, showing the thief in action. We blur everybody else in those um, those sequences usually. And so that means that it's really, it's okay to save it. 
Um, and our systems are LTE connected, most of them are. And uh, this has two benefits. The one is that since they are uh, LTE connected, we don't have to get L uh, integrations into the um, ethernet of the shop, which would mean that we have to talk for like a year with the IT department of the, uh, the chain uh, to make sure everything is compliant. And so if we bring our own system, basically it's independent of that, it makes it much easier. And uh, the other thing is that, um, and we just needed to push stuff, and so that means that we can uh, build basically stuff in a in a in a kind of business model that is like a service business model because we are providing a service, and the LTE stuff is really also producing cost, and that means that um, it's much easier to argue that that we get a recurring fee out of this. And so, um, because they're, they're the retailers, usually they want to buy stuff, and it's a little bit hard to argue with them that they should rent stuff. But this is what we're doing usually. All right. Yeah. So, so what does GDPR mean for us? This is always a question that I would get more or less from everybody, but especially from technical people. Uh, the first thing is you can't always use the best tech, right? It's it's just facial recognition. It's not so clear whether facial recognition per se is not compliant with GDPR, but it is quite clear that in in practical uses, it's not going to fly because everybody's afraid of it. So you can't use that stuff. You have to work around that. But that's nice for us on the other side because not you know the the big incumbents that you have in this market like i don't know if you you get stuff from amazon or microsoft or from the big suppliers of cctv systems they usually don't care so much for the european market and so there is a lot of facial recognition going on there and so not everything is tuned for gdpr and so we are trying to brand ourselves in a way where we say we really built european solutions uh which also flies in the us by the way and so a lot of the us is turning around in the sense that um they they are more interested in uh, in data protecting solutions and privacy protecting solutions, especially on the coast. The middle of the country is a little bit of a different thing. All right, then what about Amazon Go? I already talked about that. And so it's really nice for us because it legitimizes us. And um, there are some startups that are building stuff like Amazon Go. Standard Cognition, I think, is the biggest one, but there are like 20 other startups that are doing that. And for us, the idea is that in the end, we will do that as well. But uh, we will do together with our customers, basically. We will build every step that we take towards that goal, we will build something that is of value to them. So we are really building trust, we are building a network, and that means that in the end we will be very, um, or it will be easier to sell something as big as that. Because for, for um, a tech like that, you would have to change your business model almost completely, right? This is not how a store is designed right now, and the stores are prof profitable, especially the discounter stores, they're highly profitable, and the, the, these guys are so efficient in running those stores. And so if you just come around and you say, we have great new tech and, uh, uh, you know, just change your whole business model because our tech is so cool, that's not going to fly. What you have to do is, is to, you, you have to go all these steps with them and be there when they understand that it, this is really technology that you can trust. Okay, so that's us at the moment. In the future, uh, or we have two products in the market right now. And really, really, most of what we've been doing has not so far been about building stuff that is really like groundbreaking new deep learning. Uh, things uh, we've used off the shelf models. I, in the beginning, I started building really, really complex models, and then it turns out that basically these models are incredibly hard to run uh, on on embedded devices. And so we basically we scaled it down a little bit for the moment, and we've built very good scaling uh, infrastructure around it. So the really good data scaling, really good uh, runtimes, robust and expandable runtimes, and very strong communication pipelines. And that means that right now, we, since we've over-engineered that basically, we have the basics covered and the next stuff that we can build or that we will build will be much more complex in terms of the deep learning that we will be using. And so now the deep learning itself, I mean, this is why, why you are uh, listening today. And so we have a detection model in both our products. Our products are actually very similar. Um, and so both our products run a detection model in soft real time. These models are right now, they are SSD Mobile v 2 based, so really vanilla standard models. Um, 
But the, as I said, the benefit of running vanilla models is that you can find easy conversion for all the different embedded hardware uh, devices that you're, you're running. And that is much more valuable than using something that's a little bit newer, that is uh, maybe a little bit more efficient, because your customer is not paying you for that little bit of efficiency. In the end, it's about improving your margins more generally. And so then we find stuff like shopping carts, shopping baskets, and people in those images, right? And so we track them through the, the images. We are running stuff right now on an image by image basis, so really standard detection models. Uh, this will change for us in the future, but right now it's the case. So all the tracking that we're doing, so to know that somebody in a video sequence comes from here and goes there, this is done with a common filter based approach. So also really simple and basic, but it works well and that means we in the end we get like a path of every thing that we see and that we uh, detect and we see it coming from one part of the image and moving to another part and so we can say for example this comes from the inside of the store and is moving towards the outside of the store so this will produce an alarm and these detection models, they only look at shopping carts. They are not looking at full carts versus empty carts or the contents of carts. In the beginning, we also thought this might be something that is, is um, a reasonable idea or a good idea to, to run everything basically in an integrated system and then ask the system, is this a full card or is this an empty card? But it turns out that is quite unstable. And um, that is because um, the receptive field for the fast models is not big enough. That means if you look at the, if you have a detection model running, it's quite narrow, right? So it's, it's not very deep. It has like 13, 14 layers or something. And so which each layer or blocks, let's say for a mobile net, uh, with, with each second or third block, you have a downsampling. And that means that you have very aggressive downsampling in the beginning. And then in the end, if you look at it, the um, detector at each point doesn't see the whole image. And that means that a detector or a point on the left side doesn't know that on the right side, there might be something in the shopping cart. So if you, you uh, look at the whole shopping cart, then the left part might detect there's an empty shopping cart and the right part detects the full shopping cart because it only sees a full shopping cart or only a part of a shopping cart that is empty. That is really something that is specific about our um, our use case because the shopping cart is a semi-transparent object and so it's it's possible to look through it and a full shopping cart and an empty shop or if you have a, a sh full shopping cart that is only a little bit in it and an empty shopping cart it's almost identical basically everywhere and that is that is uh, the big problem and that means that we have specialized classifiers afterwards that run to analyze the content of the card. And there we don't run just one classifier, we run multiple classifiers in the sequence and we combine their outputs. This is a little bit like Antonio said earlier, you take the embeddings that those classifiers produce and then you, you put something on top to make sure that you have basically an integrated model that just says, okay, with very high certainty, I know this is a full shopping card. And um, you have to do that because there's occlusion, right? If you're, especially at the checkout, if you have the camera pointing down at the, the chopping cart, then uh, some parts of the cart you can't see in each image. But if you have like a sequence of images, then it becomes um, possible to see all the, uh, basically you get rid of blind spots that way. And so this is why we have to look at sequences of images. And yeah, as I said, everything is, is very, very much focused on, and on embedded devices. And so it's highly optimized to run there and to run quickly. And I will talk a little bit more about that now. But uh, first, a little bit about our, our um, background and the stuff that we've built to support everything. This is part of where I said we, we over-engineered. So we, we've built our own query language. This We call it RED. It's a um, file-based database to make data selection for training and annotation purposes very, very easy. And so this is written in Python, and it's like a um functional python so so you say you have you have a set of data uh, points and now you filter them and now you map some function on them and this kind of stuff so this is the kind of language that we have invented to make in the end um the, the assembly of golden and very very high standard data sets quite easy in order to get a very good understanding of our data because we have a lot of data and so uh, data management is really uh, strict and very very central requirement for us Another thing is all of our annotations are done in-house. So some of the tools that we, we are um, using there, we have built ourselves because we need stuff that is really tuned to our use case. Some of the stuff is open source. And so it's a mixture of those two, but everything is in-house again for data 
protection reasons and so you can't outsource stuff and you can't upload stuff even to like amazon so all the training that we're doing is also done in-house on um, on-premise service because this is more or less what our clients or our customers want from us and uh, yeah that's i think it's also a good idea because uh it's less painful yeah, we, we invest a lot in active learning. Antonio also talked about that um, and semi-supervised learning. So active learning, um, as he has already explained, is the idea to take a model that you already have to help you select the data that you want to use for uh, for annotation. So basically flag data that would be worthwhile for the model to have annotated to learn. That is rather easy for uh, classification scenarios. It's much, much harder for detection scenarios because um, uncertainty is not so clear, right? For, for uh, uh, if you have, uh, in the end, you have a softmax layer and then you, you just look at some output, you can look at how certain is the model. And then you do a little bit of ensembling, for example, with dropouts uh, in, in the middle, that's a standard active learning technique. And then you get a nice uh, understanding of which images are hard and which are easy. For detection, this is much harder because the, you don't get like one nice number back, you get like, 300 points let's say for an ssd uh image and the the classifier or the detector is uncertain about all of them but it's we don't know which which pattern of uncertainty is behind that and so selecting there is much much harder and much more intricate but it's very worthwhile because the cost per image for detection annotation or the cost per video sequence for for detection annotation is is much higher this is even worse for key point annotation if you're looking at humans or uh for segmentation annotation panoptic segmentation annotation for example for uh yeah if you want to do those tasks the other thing is semi-supervised learning so we have a lot of inflowing data for especially for the checkout product from all the stores where it's deployed, there are no no people on this this data, so we can save it, and it's it's all, uh, all nice. And so we have a lot more than we can annotate. And uh, so the question there is, what can you do? And so first thing is to use the active learning, but then afterwards the stuff that you haven't annotated, do you just throw it out, or do you keep it and uh, still make it? useful and we are trying to build stuff there we are not not done with that but we are in the process of building stuff there that um, will help us and this is semi-supervised learning basically uh, this, this is um, like the state of the art on ImageNet is within a semi-supervised scenario where you have like the 1 million ImageNet images and then you have 300 million other images that come from maybe Twitter or I think it's from Google it's a Google paper so it comes from Google I think and uh, so there you you more or less you use the stuff that, that you first you train your your um, network on ImageNet and then you use the ImageNet network as an implicit kind of teacher for itself that's a really smart way of doing it and this is the state of the art really for anything ImageNet right now uh, and so this is this is very intriguing and. Um, yeah, everything that we are deploying is really, really state of the art and cutting edge. So we've deployed, for example, Efficient Net, which came out in, I think, June of uh, last year. We deployed it three weeks after the paper was published. And that really means we deployed it to production. We built the stuff, we, we uh, trained it, and we deployed it. Right now, we're doing the same with RegNet, which is uh, a new sweet spot, This is which is more interesting than Efficient Net, um, because Efficient Net is actually not very efficient, uh, sorry for that, uh, on GPUs. The reason for that is the swish activation th that they're using. This is uh, it just, it's an activation that is very nice on GPUs, but it doesn't really work well on, on GPUs is x times sigmoid of x. And uh, this is just in terms of scaling, you can parallelize it well on, on GPUs to uh, this is the way it seems. Maybe uh, NVIDIA and the other guys can do something about it, but right now it's not really optimized. Yeah, so so this is what we deployed, for example, for for um, classification, and we have also implemented uh, efficient debt, which is the detection version of the efficient net, uh, which is also like or was for a few months at least the state of the art for uh, for fast and efficient uh, object detection, and we have implemented that, and I think open sourced it one month after the paper was published, or one and a half months maybe after the paper was published. And uh, Google has recently open sourced their own implementation, but uh, yeah, we've also done that because we think it's really useful to have this kind of feedback with the uh, uh, community and this kind of interaction with the community. And we will continue doing that. We will also continue publishing papers a little later. Yeah, 
So now I have a little bit of time left and I will talk about deployment uh, because this is also the title of my talk. And so the uh, we are, uh, or yeah, this is one one step before that. We Our devices, they really have to be appliance, appliances. That means they have to be incredibly easy to use. They have to be built in a way where basically you can put them in a store and leave them running there without any kind of interaction because everybody in the store, all they can do is just, you know, turn it off and on again. This is more or less everything that you can do in terms of, of uh, first level support. Everything else would be you have to replace the device. So you have to build stuff in a way where it is really robust. And so it's at the same time, it's in rather hostile environments, right? It will be somewhere on the ceiling of a store, in the back office of a store, in, in the checkout, which is really, you know, not so nice. And, uh, and so you have to build stuff in a way where it's incredibly robust. And so, for example, a fan is usually not a good idea. Uh, you need passive cooling. You, you have a lot of other constraints that you have to think about. And you have to solve all this. So nobody in retail cares about you having fancy technology. They care about useful things. And so the idea is that you build stuff in a way where it's a tiny little black box and it solves that problem. And they will give you nice money for it <laughs> if it works like that. And um, but, but nobody really wants to know why it is doing what it's doing. It's just supposed to work, right? And so if you expose any kind of complexity to um, the, the people uh, in the store or, or even the managers in the, the headquarters, this will do you no good. You, you just have to say, here's the box. It does what, what you want. And uh, so yeah, next thing is big deployment. So we are approaching a very big deployment. And so what do, have you, do you have to do there? We, you have to think about really these devices, these, these tiny embedded boxes as, um, as IoT devices. So you have an internet connection to them, but you have to expect them to, to be yeah, like 10,000 of them. And so you have to think about how to update them, how to monitor them, how to uh, manage everything and get get uh, or understand where something is failing because something is will be failing, right? If you have 10,000 devices out in the open, some of them will fail. Just this is, this is clear. The devices are not that reliable. They are very reliable, but if you have 10,000, then still some of them will fail. And these kinds of things. So that is that is something that we are scaling at the moment. The next thing is this continuous improvement in model quality. I already talked a, lot, a little bit about that. So you have really big data flows coming in. You have to thought through that data, and you have to uh, select the data with active learning, and then you have to train new models, and you push those models. And all of this is more or less continuous integration, right? Or in, in a continuous integration kind of loop. So you want that as automated as possible, because you will do it a lot of the time. And so that is a lot of, of uh, work, and, and very interesting work, very intriguing work. Also work that where, where there's no like precedent for known good practices or known best practices. This is like what DevOps was, I think, a few years ago. Uh, this is the new kind of um, people are calling it maybe ML ops now. But uh, to do that with uh, ML ops is usually if you do it with with streaming data in a, in a big data kind of scenario. What what we are doing here is really doing it with IoT devices, and so this is much more complicated because your connections are not good and the devices are failing for a myriad of reasons and some Somebody just put a sticker in front of a camera, this kind of stuff, right? This doesn't happen if you're in the cloud. It happens all the time for us. So you have to think a lot about uh, all these kinds of edge cases. And so, yeah, the deployment, our, our checkout system is close to a big rollout with, with Europe's largest retailer. But um, so that, that means we have to really prepare ourselves for, for all of this. So really for tens of thousands of devices. And uh, we have to do it in a way where we have tiny hardware because that's more cost efficient. And for now, we are focusing on the NVIDIA Jetson platform and now a little bit more about why we're doing that. So we, um, in the beginning, we had our own runtime, which was built in Python. Um, it's basically for commodity hardware. We, we have built it based on TensorFlow in the beginning, or actually based on Cafe for the very first version, then on TensorFlow. By now, we can load stuff from, I think, yeah, PyTorch MXNet, a lot of uh, um, accelerator tools for, for the different hardware um, um, scenarios that you can have. Um, but it's built in Python, and so it's our own runtime. So it basically takes a few camera feeds in, and then it, it batches data or batches those, those images and runs stuff and detects things and in the end decides when to give us alarms. 
And so then we, we've built those custom interfaces for the, all the embedded accelerators that you you might find out in the open. Um, I will yeah um, talk a bit more about that. But then we we decided to move to the Jetson ecosystem for for a good reason. I think because it is the most um, a deployment ready thing. The Jetson devices have been in deployment for years and years. So the Nintendo Switch, for example, almost a lot of uh, high quality cars that you find uh, in, out in the wild they, uh, for their entertainment systems, they have Jetsons. And so the, the Jetson family is responsible for one quarter of NVIDIA's total revenue. So it is really big business for them. And so that means that you can really rely on their support. And so this is why we moved to the Jetson ecosystem. And now we are moving to DeepStream, which is like a GStreamer based pipeline for uh, understanding video inputs uh, inside of an NVIDIA embedded device. And so we started with this Python runtime and um, we looked at the pros and cons of that. And so the pros are quite easily, it's very easy to write, right? Python is just a nice, nice language and everybody knows it. And, and so that's, that's cool. It's very easy to reason about as well because the code that you're writing is very explicit. It's very easy to maintain and it's very, very easy to extend. So all of these things are pretty, pretty nice. The big problem is, is incredibly slow compared to other languages. And so you have the, all those nice bindings to TensorFlow and to NumPy and these things which bring it down to lower level languages like C. Um, but still, if you have, for example, image data and you have to copy over this, this image data from, from the GPU to the CPU to do some stuff with it and then back to the GPU to do some other stuff with it, it's all just not, not a nice way of doing it. And it would be nicer to have a lower level language for that. And so, yeah. Uh, in the end, as, as I said, we decided on doing it with DeepStream. Um, but before that, we looked at the custom accelerators and we tried the Intel Movie Video Sticks, which are really like amateur devices. And Intel has a bad habit of, you know, discontinuing devices in the middle of you planning doing rollouts with them. And so that's uh, a big problem. And uh, the second version of the, the Movie Video Sticks is just not a lot faster than the first version. The next, next thing that we also tried is the Google Edge TPU, which is, um, very, very nice. I think it's not ready yet for big deployments, but it will be there quite soon. It's incredibly uh, performance or, or power efficient and performant for, for what it is and for the cost that it has. But right now, it's still a little bit too early and the tooling that Google provides is not flexible enough. But it will be there and I think it's the biggest competitor to the NVIDIA Jetsons for the, at, at the moment. We looked at Xilinx FPGAs. Um, there are uh, Xilinx bought uh, company that basically from the guy who invented pruning or not invented that's wrong but to popularize the concept of pruning and so they are uh, doing a lot now with with deep learning that is also pretty cool and pretty interesting but um in the end it's also not as flexible so you you are very close to here's a set of layers that are supported and everything else just doesn't work or you have to write stuff on an fpga which is not an expertise that we have in the company then we looked at the Huawei Ascent, um, which is their, their, their new uh, accelerator family, which is very performant, but the software is not there yet, and we have no time to wait for it. And a few other things that I can't talk about. And in the end, what remained were mixed feelings. Uh, so as I said, the best feeling we have uh, about the Google Edge TPUs, but, uh, and some of the other ones might also be relevant, but for now, we decided uh, that there are too many trade-offs uh, compared to the Jetson devices, which is why we went with them. We also had some experience with them already, uh, so we decided that uh, the TX2, uh, or, or basically we knew the TX2, and we decided that when the Jets Nano was released, it's really like a sweet spot for the stuff that we are doing for um, uh, for deployments of our check a checkout product. The Jets Nano is more or less a TX1 cut in half, so it's like a salvage. Um, thing for, for very old hardware. It's based on the Maxwell architecture. So it's it's uh, a low cost, low performance device, but it's good enough for basically what we're doing. And so it's much, much cheaper than the other Jetsons. And um, yeah, it, it worked for us. And so um, at the same time, the NVIDIA tooling is just so nice. And so that is why we, we decided to stay with it. And TensorRT, if you, you get a, a, a model and you can convert it into TensorRT, you get a very nice speed up because what TensorRT is doing, it's basically benchmarking different configurations of running convolutions and uh, to, to figure out which one is best fitting on the hardware. So you have to 
optimized tensor RT on the hardware that you will use in production, and then it will run for on a small device for like half an hour, and it will optimize uh, everything in a way where all the convolutions are mapped to memory optimally. That in the end means a big of um, big increase in throughput, which is again very nice. Then finally, there was DeepStream, and DeepStream is uh, a um, a library, I said that already from, from NVIDIA, that extends GStreamer, which is the standard video handling library of uh, Linux. I think it's from, from uh, the GNOME project originally, so from the one of the standard um, UX or UIs for, for, um, for Linux. And uh, I might be wrong there, but don't, don't kill me for that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so DeepStream uh, is very efficient because it keeps everything on the GPU. So you run, uh, first you run a, uh, like you open a video feed, you resize the stuff, you uh, put it into a detector, you get the output of the detector, you look at crops that, that you've produced with basically the bounding boxes that the detector has detected. And all of that happens on the GPU, no memory transfer involved and everything incredibly, incredibly efficient. And that means that we could do four to five streams with one device, not one stream with one device. So, so instead of running more or less, if you look at the smaller stores, instead of running one uh, system per checkout, you can run one system per store. And that of course is, is like a game changer, right? In terms of, of um, hardware cost. And so that's, that's really, really cool. Another thing that's really cool there is that if you have this running, you can, easily just deploy it on different hardware from NVIDIA. So instead of running on uh, these tiny Jets Nano devices, you can also bring it onto big inference GPUs like the NVIDIA T4. And then you can run many, many, many streams and you can do it for for stores with a lot of uh, checkouts. And so that's that's also something that's very nice because then we have one software, we just put in different hardware and we can support more or less all of our customers' needs. And yeah, the problem that we had is what to do with the Python app. So we, we had this Python app that had already all the integrations, all the messaging written, the alarms and, and all these things. And so we decided to basically expand DeepStream in a way where it can have, uh, co uh, communicate with Python. So we have a bridge uh, that we've built into Python. So we can keep our business logic that it is in Python and do the stuff that is really performance critical in DeepStream. That was something that was very, very, very painful for us um, to, to build that because it's, uh, yeah, it's not really well do documented. And uh, yeah, you, you have to just do a lot of stuff by trial and error. But in the end, you get a big reward because you can do the stuff that you want to do in Python in Python, and you uh, can keep the stuff that you, uh, you want to have in high performance versions. You can keep that in C and uh, optimized on the GPU. So yeah, that, that's really nice for us. And yeah, now we are in the process of replacing five devices with, with one and it's much more cost efficient and it's also easier to maintain because we, if you have just one device per store, then maintenance is just a piece of cake compared to, to having one device in every checkout. Yeah, so that is it about my deployments uh, or my, my story about the deployments and the, the struggles with that. Uh, so if you are in the, the scenario where you're thinking about um, deploying things on edge devices, plan much more time for, for preparing things for these deployments and more expertise and more brain power for that than for building like a like a demo of where you do some nice deep learning. The deep learning is, I mean, it's not the trivial part, but it is, it is the part that is, uh, yeah, you, you will get that done. The, the problem is to get it in a way where, where it's really uh, robust and, and deploy ready or deployment ready. And so, yeah, th this is now as the last slide, basically, what is the future for us in terms of the deep learning? As I already said, we have uh, been playing uh, or we, we've been building all these tools and we've used basic models and this will change from now on. And so we have been hiring and we will continue to hire a lot of deep learning expertise, um, which is, of course, if somebody's interested, I would be glad to uh, uh, to yeah, basically get to know you. And so we will go into action recognition, so video-based action recognition. So really the question, what is somebody doing in front of a shelf in, in the store? How are they behaving towards other people? What What is happening generally in the store? And so there you, you have video feeds and you, you want to understand on a very, very high level what somebody's doing. Not like, yeah, man is, man is scratching his head, but 
but even higher level, even longer context um, patterns. And this is going to be very, very interesting for us. The second thing is we will switch over to a real video-based model. So instead of putting one model into a detection or uh, one, one image in a detection model, running that and then post-processing everything to associate it over time, we are building models that will be really video-based. And so that will be much more flexible. This is uh, a lot of research is going into that uh, that area right now to get rid of the redundancy. So in a video, if you look at it, most of the pixels don't change, especially if your, your camera doesn't change. And so if you can use the right techniques, like for example, versions of attention, then you can build models that are incredibly efficient and much stronger compared to detection plus post -proce processing. And so this is what we're very excited about. And uh, the, the third thing is to build GDPR compliant tracking of customer journeys. So find people again in the store. Uh, so you have a few cameras in the store and you want to find the same person who worked from there to there, even though you don't cover the whole path. And you want to do that in a GDPR compliant way where you basically, if somebody changes something about their appearance, let's say removes their jacket, we lose them because we are not allowed to track them then anymore. And yeah, these are the things that we are building at the moment. And um, yeah, I think that is it from me. Thank you very much. Hi, great. Um, thank you, Christoph. That was fantastic. So My there pleasure. was some questions that actually uh, yeah. came in. Uh, during that for yourself and for Antonio. So I'm looking to see if we can get Antonio back on now as well. But I suppose if we start off the first question uh, to you on Slido was, what is the name of the detection models you use again? Okay, uh, so the model that we have in deployment right now is an SSD mobile net v2. That's like really the most standard model that you, you can find. Um, we also deploy a few other models like the efficient debts that we, we've talked about uh, or that, that I talked about. But uh, yeah, the standard model is an SSD mobile net. And the, the real reason for that is compatibility. And so you want a model that basically everybody has seen already because then all the hardware acceleration is already prepared for that. Okay, um, excellent. There was two more for you as well. Um, you are using your own camera devices. Where do you run? Where the deep learning algorithms run? So you are using your own camera devices. Where do the deep learning algorithms run? Yeah, on the Jetsons. So, so basically, maybe this can, uh, question came in before I talked a lot about the Jetsons. <laughs> and so, so yeah, it's basically you have the camera. The camera is connected either of an IP uh, connection, so Ethernet, or with a USB connection to this embedded device. And uh, there's a Jetson in there, so Nvidia Tegra. And um, we have some deployments where we have other systems, where we have, for example, just standard vanilla PCs running. Um, but most of the stuff that we will be doing going forward, at least for the time being, will be based on the, the Jetson devices. Excellent. And, and the last one we had is, where can I get the data for card classifier? Any open source data available? No, nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, but you have to do it yourself. I can tell you in the very beginning when we started the company, me and my co-founders, we um, we got some shopping carts and we spent hours and hours and days and days just taking images of full and empty shopping carts. This is how you do that stuff. So if you want to do these kinds of things, usually you have to do it yourself. And at some point you can pay people for that maybe, but if you are starting out with something, just go ahead and do it. And so it's painful. <laughs> Excellent. We had a, we had a question come in as well. Actually, since you since we started doing Q and A, um, do you hire entry level data scientists? Um, for us, it really depends on what kind of background somebody has. If somebody basically, for example, comes from economics and has not a lot of programming experience and has just basically dabbled a little bit in, in data science, that is tricky for us. If somebody has good experience in, in computer science already, but already st only started in, in the data part of it, that is more interesting for us. So we want, or we're looking for people who are really good programmers. And uh, of course, we're also looking for people who are really good at deep learning and have a very good high level and conceptual understanding of things. But you have to have one of those two. And if you're a beginner in both, uh, that is tricky for us. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Question now Thanks. for uh, Antonio. Um, Antonio, what advice do you have for data scientists starting out in computer vision on how to improve the industry standard and to become employable? And how to improve to the industry standard, sorry. How to improve to the industry? I guess that means uh, to get good enough to become employable. I guess that's what they're asking. Yeah. Oh, I would advise to I would advise these people to just pick a project that they find interesting and try to learn as much as possible by working through it, by trying to solve a problem that they care about and reading what's out there, reading what's out there and trying to implement something. For me, when I started in computer vision, this was working on brain tumor segmentation. I did research on how to segment tumors in magnetic resonance imaging and just reading what was the state of the art and implementing different models gave me practical knowledge that overlaps with many other different problems in biomedical imaging and also consumer uh, computer vision. So just picking something that you're passionate about and trying to learn as much as possible by solving it the best way you can and actually publishing your code on GitHub and sharing it with people, maybe even writing a blog post about it. I think it's a very good approach in order to get employable. It's a way to show that you actually uh, know how to solve a problem and that you took time to research how to do it in the best way possible. Okay, just checking. Um, uh, uh, may may, may I add, add something? Uh, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, d d sure. I, I would say it's it's uh, it's exactly right what Antonio is saying. I think another thing, if you want to be hired, do something as your project that is surprising. Do something where you know if if I'm reading an application, somebody's doing something that's really creative. It doesn't really matter whether they did it in a, in a super great way, right? But if I see this creativity where somebody really had a, a genuine new idea, that is that is fantastic. And so, so if you're doing like the 100 million cat and dog classifier or whatever, then yeah, I don't care. I know that you can find tutorials for that. But if you show that that kind of a little bit of understanding and a little bit of insight and a little bit of, of extra motivation, that I think is very good. Excellent. Um, any more questions to come in via Slido? No. Perfect. Um, so I think I think we'll wrap it up there. So these uh, these videos will go online and be streamed live and be available to rewatch on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to look to to sort of jig them around so that they're in two separate. Two separate videos because I know uh, I think I delayed by maybe about six minutes by having bad audio at the start. Uh, so again, I'd like to apologize for that. And we're back next week um, with two topics on healthcare. And it's going to be guys from Marco from BioTX and Bjorn from Surgical.ai are going to talk about how they're using AI and data science um, to to go through. Uh, to, to impact their customers and if you have time I'm going to include a link um, that will direct you to a breakout session and you'll be able to talk directly through Christoph and Antonio um, I'll just put that link into the live chat comments so if you want to direct yourself to that you will be able to uh, have a video call to them but please keep in mind they are restricted to six people per room just just in terms just to make sure that that they stay and um, they stay at a nice size and everyone can can get their questions across and the link for that is available on screen now